I'm Andrea Donsky, host of the Morphous from Menopause podcast and right here on YouTube on our Morphous show. Today, we're going to be talking about phytoestrogen foods with a naturopathic doctor, Jennifer Harrington, who I've had on the show before. You are going to love what we are talking about. And if you're in perimenopause and menopause, you're going to want to stay tuned. Welcome back to the show, Jen. I'm so happy to see you and have you back on our show. Thank you so much for inviting me back. I had so much fun chatting with you last time, and it's a joy to be here again today. I love that you're a naturopathic doctor and you focus on nutrition. Can you introduce yourself so everybody, if they haven't listened to your other interviews, so they know exactly who you are and what you do? Okay. So first of all, I think it's important to let your listeners know that I am a perimenopausal woman. I'm going through the transition with them. So I hear you and I feel you because I'm in the same boat. And what I really focus on is helping a woman naturally transition into the healthiest, happiest state she can be, not only now, but for the rest of her life. I love that. All right, so let's talk about phytoestrogen foods. What are they? So what is a phytoestrogen and how do they help us from a nutrition standpoint as our hormones start to decline? So in perimenopause, we know our estrogen and our progesterone, they're going up and they're going down, they're kind of all over the place. And we know in menopause, they go down, they decrease dramatically. Can you please share what that is? Sure. So phytoestrogens are plant-based compounds that have an estrogen-like effect in the body. They're found in fruits, in vegetables, in nuts and seeds and legumes. And they're more estrogen modulators. So if you're in a state of high estrogen, they actually help to reduce your estrogen load. And if you're in a state of low estrogen, they help to boosts your estrogen level so that it's more of a, a modulator. So it balances out for where you are at your particular point in time. So being a phytoestrogen, it is roughly one to four times weaker than a natural estrogen. So you're not going to get the same effect, but you're going to have an effect. And um, I, I love them. Food is medicine. Why, why pop pills when you can take food? I love that philosophy and I agree. And I do believe in supplements, but I know that, and I know you do too. And, um, but today we're going to focus strictly on nutrition. Is there any downside? So before we go into what they are and, and, and how they work in the body, is there any downside to eating these foods, you know, when it comes to quantity or the types of foods? First of all, when we're looking at, say, for example, we were using estrogen therapy or menopause hormone therapy. The downside of that is that we can stimulate growth. So estrogen being a growth hormone, we can stimulate growth in the breasts, in, in the ovaries, in the uterus, and we don't want to do that. So when we're looking at the estrogen receptors, we've got estro estrogen receptor alpha and estrogen receptor beta. And it's the alpha receptors that are located in the hypothalamus part of the brain, which regulates reproduction. It's also found in the breasts, in the uterus, in the ovaries. And there are some common areas with the two receptors, like bone and heart. But your estrogen receptor betas aren't located in the same areas. So like I said, there is some commonalities, like the heart and the bones. In the brain, it's in the hippocampus, which is more to do with cognition and learning and memory and all those wonderful things. So there are some slight differences, but as a general rule, phytoestrogens are a safer route to help women ease their menopausal symptoms because it doesn't have that prolific growth effect that estrogen normally has. So what are some examples of some phytoestrogen foods that we should be incorporating into our diet? My favorites, the ones that I personally take. Now, I, I need to uh, reference this with saying I'm a Western woman. So your culture here matters. As a Western woman, majority of my phytoestrogens are going to come from lignans. So in my case, I have flaxseed. And flaxseed has 800 times more lignans than any other food source. But I also love pomegranates and broccoli. So they're the three staples that I personally use. And we can talk about dosages and how to use them later on. But that they're the ones that work for me. If I was an Asian woman then maybe I'd be looking more down the soy route. But as a Western woman, I can't metabolize it. And we can chat about that later on. Um, with Middle Easterns, they tend to have more um, pomegranates, more the elagia tannins. So it does matter where you come from. Jen, you mentioned the word lignans. Can you explain what that is? 
Absolutely, I would love to. So lignans are a component from flaxseed. So flax seeds have 800 times more lignans than any other food source. So if you're after lignans, go to flaxseed. Now flaxseed, I recommend you buy fresh and that you grind it as you need it. And two tablespoons is the dose. So two tablespoons, I put mine in my smoothie, but you might want to add it over your salads or over your vegetables. And what happens is the grinding process together with chewing and your digestive acids and enzymes convert flax seeds into lignans. These lignans then need to go to your digestive microbiome. So it's your good bacteria that does the final job. They convert the lignans into enterolignans and it's the enterolignans that have the phytoestrogen effect. I remember reading research on, I'm happy that you mentioned two tablespoons of ground flax seeds. And I remember there's some good research on ground flax seeds and a reduction in breast issues. Is that true? Have you come across that in your research? Yeah, that is because of the receptor route. Because it goes down, it actually has a tenfold affinity for the estrogen receptor betas. So this way, it's not having the stimulating growth benefit. Well, it's not really a benefit, is it? The, the effect um, on the breast tissue. No, and I think it, I love, again, I'm going to go back to the quantity because even when it comes to supplements, it's, it's really interesting because people have a mindset, they think more is better. So I'm going to take a lot more and that's going to help me, you know, it's going to help with all the things I need help with, but it, that isn't necessarily the, you know, the case, especially when it comes to certain foods. And I, is that the same when it comes to phytoestrogen? So like two tablespoons, you said is the dosage, but you know, is it something that we should take four tablespoons of, or, you know, like, I'd love to hear your thoughts on quantity. Well, when we look at flaxseed, flax seeds are also fiber. Mm -hmm. If you're having double the amount of fiber, you're at risk of having digestive effects. And you really want to make sure you've got adequate water and hydration along with, with the flax seed. What are some other foods that contain phytoestrogens? I know chickpeas do, and I know that um, legumes. So can you share some of the other food sources of phytoestrogens? Yes. How about I tell you about my favorite, which is pomegranate. Oh, so, that, right? I'm sorry they're in season in Australia <laughs> at the moment. They're not in season um, in Canada at the moment. Love but it. Ah, pomegranates, they just look so beautiful. Laura of Signature, they're for ovarian health. They're delicious. When we're looking at the, the pomegranate itself, though, when you cut it open and you're taking out the arils, so you've got the fruit and you've got the seed inside, some people just try to nibble off the fruit and throw away, throw away the seed. Please don't do that. The seed is the world's highest source of omega-5. And omega-5 is not one of the popular ones, but it is such a powerful insulin resetter. So if you're having issues with insulin resistance and blood sugar levels, omega-5 is so easy. You chuck it in with your smoothie, blend it up. That way you've blended up the seed as well. I normally put one or two slices of banana in my smoothie too, just to absorb some of that grittiness. And you're getting the, the benefits of the omega-5 as well as the phytoestrogen, which is found in the fruit or the juice. There's a reason we call it a superfood. It's chock full of antioxidants, which it's incredible, incredible food. So we talked about flax seeds, we talked about pomegranates. What are some other phytoestrogens? And by the way, I do want to go back to you. You mentioned uh, you, you touched on insulin resistance, which I do want to go back to. So I'm not, I'm kind of saying it to you too, so I don't forget. All right, let's move on to another other sources of phytoestrogens. All right, maybe we should touch on the most common one, which is one that I know that you and I don't love. Mm -hmm. And that is soy. Yeah. And there's a reason why, well, there's many reasons why. Um, let's start with genetically modified food. It is one of the most genetically modified crops on the planet. Good luck finding organic soy. Um, it is also a phytate and phytates are anti-nutrients. So they can absorb other nutrients that are in the system. They contain trypsin inhibitors, which can cause digestive upsets. But the main reason why I don't recommend soy is because you're not getting bang for your buck. We know that 20 to 30% of Western women can convert soy into its active equal. So without that, you're not getting the benefit of the phytoestrogen. 
If I was a Japanese woman, then I know that 50 to 60% of the Asian population can convert soy into its active, in, active ingredient. And um, there was a research trial done in Spain. So we've got to keep in mind it's in Spain, but in this particular study, only one of the volunteers, that was 7% of the, the cohort, could convert soy into equal where 100% could convert soy, I mean, sorry, flaxseed into its actives and the majority could do pomegranate. So it really matters what background you're from. And most Japanese or Asian women eat soy in its fermented state. So they're having natto, they're having tempeh, they're having it in different forms that us Westerners eat. When I go to the supermarket, I see this highly, highly processed textured soy protein and I wouldn't feed it to my dog. So um, I, I'm, I agree with you. And it's also it has such a negative impact on the thyroid. I, I mean, I'll tell you an interesting story that I was drinking a soy shake because I just wanted to try it. I like to experiment a lot. And this was even before I was uh, in menopause. And I was having, I think it was like five or six grams of scoop in, in the shake. And then the company switched it to 12 grams, but I didn't realize it, that they had switched the serving size. And within not very long, I had literally gained, I think, 10 pounds, like within a short period of time. And I couldn't understand. I'm like, why am I gaining weight? Anyways, I ended up going back and having my thyroid tested and realizing that it actually negatively impacted my thyroid. So, I mean, in general, for all the reasons you mentioned, which by the way, in North America, you can have, um, there is quite a bit of access to organic soy. Okay. And um, so you, there is more access to it. But again, I'm still not a big fan, especially for this phase of life, for perimenopause and menopause. And I know you're going to agree with me, Jen, in, you know, in general, moderation is really important. So if it is something, it's a food that you love and that you do eat it or consume it, just in moderation and take note of how you feel. If you feel that um, it's not serving you for, you know, for all the reasons we talked about, then maybe look at, you know, doing something else. And especially because if you're more vegan or vegetarian, that's, that's probably the reason why you're eating more of it, or even if you're not. Um, so just be mindful of what you're, what you're consuming, especially of this phase, at this phase of life. Mm, and how you're eating it. Is it fermented yeah. Yeah. or is it highly processed? Yeah, exactly. And I'm talking about the highly processed type of soy, the soy milk that you get in the store, which, you know, it's funny, even when I drink soy milk, the process, my throat starts to like itch me. Like I just, it doesn't do well for me, but, um, but I'm, I'm glad that you brought it up. So are there any other foods that are, that are in that category of, uh, yeah, we're not really big fan of that are, that are phyto phytoestrogens? It really depends on the individual woman because we're all different. We have different likes and dislikes. We have different allergies and food intolerances. So there's none that I dislike as much as I dislike soy. The rest of it really comes down to the woman. Like if she's got a salicylate issue, I'm probably not going to recommend that she has broccoli. It, it's an, in, an individual thing. And I love that you're saying that too, because I talk a lot about listening to our bodies. That's really, that's my mantra. Like what's good for me may not be good for you. And what, may good for, but what might be good for you is might not be good for me. And kind of that, just keeping that in mind. And even if it's a healthy food, for example, you bring up broccoli, like for some people or spinach. I was talking to somebody the other day that was telling me that they can't eat spinach because it, you know, they are completely sensitive to it and they took it out of their diet and they feel amazing. So being mindful of what we're putting in our body, because there's so many changes going on when we're in perimenopause menopause and menopause. So keeping a food diary, if you don't feel great, keep a food diary. When you eat something, see how you feel within the hour or even 24 hours after. So I think I love that you're, that you're mentioning that because that is my mantra. And I always talk about just, we, we are the captain of our own ship and, and being mindful of what we're putting in our body. Now, I don't think this conversation will be complete unless we talk about some of the roadblocks, some of the reasons why phytoestrogens fail. So if you are consuming phytoestrogens and you're not getting the effects, you're still having your hot flushes, you're still having your menopausal symptoms, there are three roadblocks that can stop the effectiveness of phytoestrogens. So the first one is your digestive health. You've already heard me mention that it starts with chewing. <laughs> so not inhaling our food, actually sitting down, enjoying a meal, chewing. 
It then goes to our acids and enzymes. And we know during menopause, we do get a reduction in the amount of acids and enzymes that we produce. So it could be that we need to start there. Or it could be that there's dysbiosis, there's some bad bugs in our gut, or maybe not enough good guys. Now, I'm a fan of testing. And for my one-on-one -on -one patients, I do do a lot of microbiome testing just to check that out, because it could be a little tweak now, which will save you lots of money in the future because you can use food as medicine more effectively. The second roadblock that I come across is nutritional deficiencies. I like to think of, I've got my receptor and I've got my estrogen or my phytoestrogen. In order for that to bind and to have an effect, we need to have certain cofactors and there are common nutrients that act as cofactors like your B vitamins, your iodine, which is why soy being a goitrogen is such a big problem. Magnesium, zinc, vitamin A, we need to make sure we've got these. And for my patients, I also check for nutritional deficiencies actually before we start phytoestrogen therapy because there's no point going down that path if we've got deficiencies. We really need to top that up first. So yes, I, I am a fan of supplements, but I'm also a fan of food. And I just want to make sure that the supplements I'm giving is going to help a woman in the long run, especially if it means that she can cope better with, with food. And then the final roadblock is one that you're probably the expert to talk to about, and that is xenoestrogens, because these can block receptors. And xenoestrogens are everywhere mold, um, plastics, chemicals, they're everywhere. So I always make sure that I look at the roadblocks before fully getting into a phytoestrogen nutrient program. Yeah, pesticides and foods. I mean, you're talking, it, we, you know, chemicals in our makeup, it's, it, they're everywhere. So, and you bring up a good point. Before we end the interview, can you share a couple more foods? Just because I want to have a love, like a, an amazing list for people to when they're next time they're going to the grocery store, they're, so they know what to be purchasing. So we've got the flax seeds, the ground flax seeds. So if you're not going to buy ground flax seeds, you can you use a coffee grinder and just grind them yourself, store them in that container, like Jen said, and put them in the fridge or the freezer. And we've got our pomegranates. We know that we are not big fans of soy. What are some other phytoestrogen foods? We mentioned legumes like chickpeas. What are some other ones? Yes, so pretty much think of all of your nuts and seeds, all of your fruits and vegetables, all of your legumes, kidney beans, chickpeas, the lot. There is some in garlic and onion. There's some in coffee. Um, I, I think it's better just to have a plate full of fruit and vegetables and having snacks as nuts and seeds or putting these kind of things in your smoothies just to increase the nutritional content because these foods are more than just the phytoestrogens that they contain. And now you wanted to come back to blood sugar regulation because these foods can also help with insulin resetting so that, that you're less insulin resistant and you have better blood sugar balance. Yeah, I mean, you're really talking about whole foods. Like when I hear you speaking, you're talking about whole foods, not ultra processed foods, foods that have our vitamins, our minerals, our antioxidants, they have our fiber, you know, they have the, so it, it's really about getting those clean, you know, whole foods into our diet. And Yes. So insulin resistance, as we get into perimenopause and menopause, first of all, aging in general, you tend to become more insulin resistant, but being in perimenopause and menopause even adds to that equation. Lucky us. <laughs> so maybe just go over really quickly what insulin resistance is for those who are newer to our podcast, because we've done several, I've done several interviews on insulin resistance. I highly recommend checking out our other podcasts as well as our other YouTube videos. But Jen, maybe you can give a really quick definition of what it is and why it's really important that we manage our blood sugar at this stage of life. Yeah. So I think it starts with when you consume a food and especially a sugar or a carbohydrate. So you're consuming this, your body's going, oh, I have sugar in the system. It goes, okay, we'll keep a teaspoon of that for instant energy. We maybe put a tablespoon of that away for, for later on. And the rest of it, insulin grabs and converts into short, puts into fat cells for, for later on. But the more sugar, the more carbohydrates we consume, the more insulin our body is pumping out. And it gets to a point where we're pumping out so much insulin that our cells just go, hold on, 
no, nah, we're, we're not listening to this anymore. It's like little kids going, la, 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 I'm not listening to you. And that is what our body starts doing to insulin. And therefore, we can't effectively regulate our blood sugar levels anymore. And this leads into prediabetes. And I was listening to a podcast by Dr. Pearl Mutter, and he was saying that a a HbA1c over 5.2 is where you start seeing brain shrinkage. Now, this isn't even highlighted. Like doctors won't be going, it's a problem. They normally start worrying it at 5.5. But I'm worried about it at 5.2 or 5.1. I want to see it under 5 because... I don't want my brain to shrink. Jen, what's your opinion on eating fruit? So obviously vegetables are really important, but what about when it comes to fruit and insulin resistance and spiking our blood sugar? Okay, what a loaded question. (laughs) It is such an individual factor. And for most women, it's more about looking at what they're eating rather than avoiding it altogether. So some women aren't having any fruit, which is a problem because I want them to be having some fruit. Some women are having too much fruit or too much of the wrong fruits for them. So as a general rule, we know that the stone fruits, your mangoes, your peaches, that these are much higher in sugar. Most women tolerate better your berries. So I know they're in season for you guys at the moment. So your blueberries and your strawberries, um, that might be a better option. But again, it's looking at the woman sitting in front of me and what she can and can't um, tolerate. And also you mentioned it earlier, quantity, right? So I know Mm. for me, I can have a half an apple and I'm okay. A half a cup of blueberries, I'm okay. As soon as I consume too many fruits or too many of certain types, then my blood sugar will spike. So, and I do love that too. And not really removing any food groups, unless they are something that doesn't do well for you, because we're also individual as we talked about earlier, right? So I think that's an important point. Well, I love this conversation. I love that, you know, we're talking about phytoestrogen foods because especially as we're in menopause and our estrogen and progesterone levels have really plummeted, women need, and let's say HRT is not for them or BHRT is not for them because it's not, not everybody's a candidate for it. Not that, you know, whatever I'm all, I, from the point of view that whatever works for you is amazing, um, but it's not necessarily for everybody. So what are some last thoughts on phytoestrogen foods? Maybe, you know, how often we should consume it or, you know, just some last tips that anybody who's listening to this podcast can leave with. Sure. So something that you touched on before was looking at having a diet diary. I also think women should have a symptom diary. Mm -hmm. That way that they can judge what they're doing and is it working? So if you are having phytoestrogen therapy, you can see, okay, yes, I'm getting benefit from having this food. Or if I'm not getting benefit Do I try a different phytoestrogen or do I go down and have a look at those three factors that I've mentioned before? But as a general rule, women need to have phytoestrogens daily to see an effect. So we'll talk about a couple of doses. So as I mentioned before, flaxseed is two tablespoons. If you're having pomegranate, it's a quarter of a cup or half the actual fruit. If we're looking at broccoli, Broccoli is actually 500 grams, which is two heads of broccoli, which is a lot of broccoli. I love broccoli. I eat broccoli most days, but I don't eat 500 grams. So I actually have a sprouted broccoli powder that I also add into my smoothies. So it's about trying things and say, okay, this week I'm going to try two tablespoons of flaxseed every day. How do I feel? writing it down. Do you have more symptoms? Do you have less symptoms? Is your digestion working better? What's going on? And then you might want to try another one, or maybe you won't want to try it all. But it, I really think it's also important that you gauge how you're feeling and if it's working. Jen, where can people learn more about you and the programs you offer? I would start by heading to my website, which is menopausenaturalsolutions.com. I also have a podcast of the same name, Menopause and Natural Solutions. I love it, Jen. Thank you so much for being on our show today. Thank you so much for having me. If you got value out of today's interview, please give us a big thumbs up and please share our podcast and our interview because the more you share shows your care. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.